Good day, everybody, and welcome to lesson number nine in the Ben and Boz narrated PowerPoint series. I'm Boz. I'm Ben. What's going on today, man? I'm doing well. I'm particularly excited for this one. You know why? Uh, do you like bonds? Well, no. Well, they're okay. I mean, it's fine. But you said narrate PowerPoint series. Yes. We're breaking out of PowerPoint oh, today. Oh, that's mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. We're going to involve a little Microsoft Excel. Get into Excel. It's, it's pretty pretty big day. It is a big one. So, well, I think uh, you're the pilot today. And I'm the oh, co-pilot. I'm pilot, excited for so. that. I did save a few slides for you, though. Well, I appreciate I'll make sure that. to let everybody know which ones are for you. <laughs> appreciate it. I'll take a nap. Wake me up when it's time. Oh, uh, All right. Well... Let's get going with, as always, our focus company. This time, it is going to be Disney. Disney. I've been to Disney World and Disneyland. All right. I have two, but I don't really love them, so it's okay. <laughs> I do like the company Jeez. Disney. It is fascinating. So, yeah. um, as you can see here, we have an excerpt from their balance sheet with all their current liabilities as well as long term. And in particular, the bonds piece, that's going to be this $6 billion so six thousand one hundred seventy-two million, six billion of current portion of borrowings, and the nineteen billion of borrowings. I was going to ask you where the bonds were. This lesson is bonds. Yeah, they call it, it they bonds. call it borrowings, but borrowings. most of that is bonds. Bonds are borrowings. That's um, right. But we do a lot of slides like this, don't we? Where we bring in some oh, extra yeah. from the financial statements. Absolutely. We're going above and beyond today. Yeah, you're going to pull on something. Beyond from... bond. There's a joke in there somewhere. I, it's got like an extra go above couple and bond words. Today. We're going above and bond today, <laughs> boss. Don't quit your day job. <laughs> well, my day job is teaching. That's what <laughs> we're doing true. right now. That's so. true. So. All right. Anyway, mm -hmm. so this is from FINRA. Which is a you know financial? What does FINRA even stand for? Uh, it's some sort of financial database. Yeah, <laughs> that what does it stand for though? <laughs> You're the side guy. You're supposed to look it up. I should. I apologize for that. No, that's you okay. explain it to Don't them. Don't worry. So anyway, what we have on this website here is you can find all the specific bond issuances that Disney has done because bonds are actually publicly available for a lot of people, and that you or I we could buy bonds in Disney if we wanted to. We believed in them. Um, so this is just an excerpt of a few of them. These are medium-term notes, as you can see. Um, they're callable. We're going to talk about what that means. Subproduct is bond type. That's more with FINRA, not anything related to this bond. The coupon. That is what Disney is actually paying on those bonds. So this first one, you can see they're paying 2.75%. All the way down to the last one, they're paying 3%. Maturity dates, um, 2021 all the way to 2046. We have some ratings here. So bond rating agencies like Moody's and S&P, they're going to go ahead and help investors figure out if they want to loan Disney their money or not in the form of a bond by assigning a rating to Disney. So is A-plus pretty good, Boz? It is. Uh, the best bond ratings out there are AAA. You see very few that are rated at that. Um, it goes down AAA, AA, and then down to A, and then they can have pluses or minuses. Then down to triple B, and then once you get below triple B, then the interest rates start to go up as the bonds start to get more risky. Yeah, and it doesn't really have anything to do with the accounting, at least in this range anyway. No. And so yeah, A, a does not mean that that's perfect <laughs> like an account. No, if you're an no. A plus bond, that doesn't mean 100. percent So triple A plus would be the possible, yeah. the highest possible. But we think it's good for you guys to see a little context and that these are. Um, pretty prevalent. There's a ton of bonds. Bond market is huge. And you're going to learn today how to do the inside piece of it, how yeah. to do the accounting for them. Exactly. Again, you said this came from FINRA, and I use this thing called Google, Ben. It's the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority. Boz, you're using Bing. I can see your computer <laughs> you're right Bing. now. Are you embarrassed you're, to use Bing? I, I just typed into my search bar, man. It's whatever Bing. came yeah. up, mm -hmm. so I don't know. You should maybe use Bing to find out what Google is. <laughs> You just, you, I haven't had enough coffee to take. Yeah, I'm feeling a little, so I'm feeling a little away. sharp today. Yeah. Anyway, let's talk through an overview. Goals for today. One, we want to understand the terminology used when discussing bonds. And two, we want to understand how to record bond transactions and do the accounting for bond tr transactions at three different pieces. When they're issued at par, at a discount, and at a premium. So we'll go through examples of each of those. And by the time we're done, you're going to be experts. You could teach this class. Wow. Right? It would put us out of business. Uh-oh. Well, <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> so, I don't know. So let's start. Just big picture. What is a bond? Why would a company ever issue a bond? I guess we haven't even addressed the what is a bond piece of it. So a bond is when a company raises money by issuing debt. We say issuing debt as in they're taking out a loan. And a lot of times, if companies want to raise money, they can either issue new shares 
or they can get a loan with a bank, or they can do this bond where they're going to essentially get a loan from a bunch of individual investors. Exactly. So why would a company, do you think, want to use bonds as a as compared to uh, as compared to stock? Yeah, well, just kind of like debt versus stock is the is the main question. Yeah, and debt versus equity is usually what you yeah what you hear people refer to this to or when they're talking about it. Just mm-hmm. so you're good with the technical terms. Mm-hmm. Um, but one issue when you issue new shares of stock, you dilute the ownership. So if Vaz and I already own shares of Disney and Disney decides they're going to finance a new movie and they want to issue some new shares of stock to raise the money for that, um, unless Boz and I bought a proportional piece of that new issuance, we would be, I guess, having less of an ownership stake. And so a lot of times owners don't want to dilute the ownership that they have. Exactly. Um, Another one, bonds are a lot of times cheaper than providing financing from shareholders. So when you have a shareholder, I think about the cost that I owe that shareholder. Well, I'm going to pay dividends. I yeah, and theory, dividends aren't legally required. They're so not is, required. is there a cost to actually, you know, having shareholders? I was actually just looking at this one yeah, of my other yeah. classes. And mm-hmm. if if say you have a history of paying dividends and all of a sudden you cut your dividend or you skip it, your stock price takes a huge tank. GE did that once. They'd paid mm-hmm. them forever, cut paying them and stock mm-hmm. price got smoked. Yeah. That was actually the example I was looking at this wow, morning. Wow, wow. What are the we, odds? I, Must have I been a big deal. Yeah, it was. Um, but then also shareholders want to have some sort of return through share price appreciation. And so they expect Disney to continue to provide those returns. So um, that can get pretty expensive. You know, on a simple basis, we could just say shareholders probably want a 10% return. I mean, we could argue that and percent back and forth. It really depends on the industry and how, how risky that the company is. But let's just start with 10%. Are you okay with that? I'm good with 10%. That's so, Historically, yeah. S&P 500 has returned about 10% yeah. with obviously periods of increasing and decreases. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. we're digressing. Um, anyway, the other part, by issuing bonds, the interest is tax deductible. And Boz, I'm not going to take this. This is one of the nuggets I put in here for you. <laughs> so go ahead. I, well, what, what we're just saying on that one is if we make an interest payment to our bondholders, uh, or you know, on, on, on any sort of borrowing, we get to take a tax deduction for that. So, as an example, the U.S. Uh, corporate tax rate uh, just dropped to 21 percent. Um, if uh, why are you Woo-hoo! laughing? <laughs> We're happy about that. <laughs> no, I'm happy so, about you getting excited getting for, a, for about tax. the tax rate yeah. dropping. So, if a company uh, issues uh, debt and it has a five percent interest rate on that, it's going to get 21 cents back on the dollar, which is about a dollar back then. Um, so, a five percent interest rate before tax is similar to a 4% interest rate after tax. Conversely, when you make dividend payments, you do not get a tax deduction. So on a dividend payment. So that sounds what, like a topic for a tax class. It does. I'm moving on. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you would. So that's why it makes sense to issue bonds instead of new shares of stock. The next question is, why issue bonds instead of just borrowing straight from a bank? Talking to the bank and say, hey, I want to do a new movie. Can you give me a loan for it? Mm-hmm. Um One, bond issuances can be really large. Not always big. A lot of Disney's are about a million dollars per issuance, Mm -hmm. but they can raise a lot more than that if they need to. I once worked on a bond bond issuance for one of our clients, and it was a billion dollars. Wow. And so Mm -hmm. um, usually one bank isn't going to have a billion dollars or want to make that big of a loan to one customer. And so by issuing bonds, you can use tons of different investors, and you can raise larger amounts of money. Mm -hmm. Um, Second one, Having additional borrowing options, that can help you reduce your interest rates too. If you just get everything from the bank, well then the bank can just basically charge you whatever you want, but you might as well explore your options. It's kind of like an economic concept. You have higher supply and it's going to drive the price down. Nice, boss. Thanks, Tax, man. econ. Wow, bringing it all in. You're great. You're great today. Appreciate You're on. It. Appreciate so, it. Um, issuing debt, however, is riskier than issuing shares because, as Boss mentioned before, you're not legally required to pay dividends. You don't have to do that. So once the shareholders give you your money, you don't, as a company, technically need to pay them the dividends. No one's um, ever gone bankrupt without liabilities. It's a, Deep insightful. thoughts from Boz. That so is insightful. You got liabilities. You can go bankrupt, though. Could you record more of your deep thoughts? <laughs> that was the only one that That's I it? have. It's, it's, it's already been recorded. Boz, are you putting on your jacket to leave for the day? I am. That's all I've got. <laughs> You're done? Uh, he's not, actually. But um, I am going to. With debt, you are locked into those interest payments and the principal repayments, so you lose that flexibility. Mm-hmm. So pros and cons about why you want to issue bonds. Um, with this course, or this chapter, I guess, this lesson, we're going to go through how do you actually go about issuing the bonds. So big picture, a couple things I want you to know. There are secured bonds and unsecured bonds. So secured bonds are backed by collateral, meaning 
if Disney doesn't pay, then whoever you know is the trustee taking care of all the bonds on behalf of the investors, they'll be able to go and I don't know, take something from Disney. Maybe they'll take down a roller coaster, <laughs> sell that, and all the proceeds will be distributed. A claim to some fixed assets. Yeah, that's so what secured bonds a mean. Um, <laughs> on secured bonds. If I do something stupid like that, they're more likely to remember it. That's, that's kind of actually goal. true. It <laughs> um, makes me chuckle. Um, unsecured bonds that are not backed by collateral, so it's a little bit more risky for investors. They're backed by Disney's good name. Good name. Mm-hmm. The full faith yep. and Reputation. confidence of Disney. That's right. But that being said, if they don't pay, you can't go yeah. after them. Or get As a result, them. an unsecured bond would have a slightly higher interest mm-hmm. rate than a secured bond. Yeah. But Disney gets to keep their roller coasters, so. <laughs> That's a good point. Um, term versus serial bonds. So term, they're paid off at the end of the loan with a large lump sum. That's what you see most bonds are. But there are also some serial bonds where throughout the loan, you're paying not only interest, if you're the company, you're paying the interest, but you're also paying back part of the principal over time so that ultimately it all ends up to zero. No big lump sum payment at the end. Um, then callable or redeemable, those two are interchangeable versus convertible bonds. So callable bonds, they can be paid off early by the company. Maybe Disney issues bonds with an interest rate of 7% and they see that, hey, interest rates now are 3%, so we can call this bond early um, and just refinance essentially at a lower interest rate. They pay all the bondholders a lot of times with a little bit of a penalty on top, so bondholders make money and then um, Disney gets to save a bunch of money over the long term. One of my clients once had a couple billion of bonds outstanding, and then they sold a large asset, a large business, and uh, got a lot of cash for doing that. They had a bunch of cash they had nothing to do with, so they retired the bonds early. They called them. Cool. Um, And then convertible bonds, they can be converted into stock of the company. Usually it's the bondholder that has a decision where they're saying, you know, maybe it's a newer startup company, so they don't want to buy stock initially but they do feel comfortable enough to loan that company money and they can have a convertible provision in there where the bond holder gets to decide, you know what, instead of Boz, you just paying me back or Disney, instead of paying me back, I'm gonna go ahead and just convert it into common stock and I'll take dividends and go on from there. That's right, yeah. I agree, That's I've seen it, it, it happens. And bonds could be both callable and convertible mm-hmm. as well. Absolutely. They could be secured serial bonds that are callable and convertible. I don't even know what you just said, but I'll just nod. I'm just reviewing the terminology. (laughs) (laughs) All right, so some more specific ones here. We've been talking about principal. Principal is the amount investors provide Disney. Disney is the issuing company. And so if Disney wants to raise a million dollars, we'll say the principal amount of the bonds is a million dollars. The coupon rate, that's also known as the stated rate. I was going to say that. Go ahead, Boz. It's also known as the stated rate. I thought you were going to explain the whole thing. (laughs) No? No. (laughs) All right. Well, I guess I'll keep going with that. The coupon rate. Also known as the stated rate. Is the interest rate that Disney is going to pay those investors. And so whatever they say they're going to pay, that's the actual cash amount that they're going to pay out each period. Um, The market rate. I don't have another name for that one. Did you have one? I don't have one. I don't, but I don't. I just think the market rate, that's basically uh, the bond market. You know, all the investors out there, uh, what do they think that a company of that level of risk uh, should be, Mm -hmm. uh, what's the required return for investing in a company of that risk with their bonds? So what does the market believe? exactly right. Good. Uh, The bond indenture, that's the legal contract with all provisions of a specific bond issuance. That's like all the legalese type piece of it. Sign your name here. The prospectus then, that's more of the pretty looking version that talks about if Disney's issuing new bonds, what do they want the bonds for, and makes their case financially that they will be able to repay any investor in these bonds. And so usually investors will look at a prospectus, make a decision, and after they decide, if they go with it, then they'll um, sign the bond indenture agreement. If you have debenture bonds with a bond indenture. You can, Yeah, I guess. I didn't, I've never thought about it. Yeah, it's a tongue twister. <laughs> Enough with the background, the terminology. Goal number one, accomplished. Let's move on to talking about bond selling at par. So this is the first type, probably the most straightforward type. Mm-hmm. Um, but when a bond is issued at par, the stated rate of interest equals the market rate of interest. So Disney would say, I think we're going to pay 3% interest. And the market would say, you know, Disney, I know your risk profile. I know your financials pretty well. I think you should have to pay about 3% interest. And if those two agree, boom, issued at par. 
that what that means is yeah par is if the bond um, says that, that, that it's going to pay out $100 at the end of the life of the bond, that the company would actually get $100 for that today. Um, that sounds obvious, like that, that would happen, right? But we're going to see where it, free, it, it basically rarely happens yeah. uh, instead. But we'll get into those. But um, Good. All right. All right. Um, so in this scenario, the company received the full amount it's asking for. You're on top of your game today. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> Look at that. Um, and every period interest expense that we record on our income statement, that is going to equal the cash payment. This seems a little bit broad right now, doesn't it? I think we should have an example. Do you want me to read it? Oh, look at that. We an got example. an example. So let's say that we've got Disney, who wants to create a new movie, and it's raising $2 million through a new bond issuance. The bonds have a stated or coupon interest rate of 3%, <laughs> and they mature in 10 years. Disney will pay interest semi-annually, which Ooh, means twice, twice per year. year. Whoa! The market oh. <laughs> rate of the interest is 3%. What is the initial journal entry that will be made when Disney issues those bonds? Well, in order to figure out the journal entry, we, we have to actually compute the, the value of the bonds that they'll be issued at. And uh, in order to do that, we need to calculate the pre present value of the principal and the interest. What do you think, Ben? You want to go through this one, or do you want me to go through well, this one? Well, I feel like we've already talked about what we're going to do on this one. So when you're doing these calculations, we're bringing in present value, which we talked about in Lesson 8. And when you have a long-term liability on your financial statements, you have to record that at present value. And so we're going to walk you through how to calculate that present value. And there are two ways. There's the fast, modern, efficient, useful way that you can do in Excel. Otherwise, there's an old... Outdated, I guess would be a better word than old. Dorky. Slow, dorky. Boz way <laughs> of calculating it. So um, Boz is going to walk you through this first example of the old way, and then I'm going to walk you through all the other examples using Excel. How's that sound, Boz? Uh, well, you framed it up so nicely. I can't wait. <laughs> so what we would do in this situation, again, we, 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 we would go back first off and we'd say, okay, $2 million. 3% interest rate, bonds mature in 10 years, and the market interest rate is 3%. When we go to our present value tables, then that $2 million, we're going to get it in 10 years. But because it's a semi-annual interest payment on this bond, we actually have to go to 20 periods because there's going to be 20 interest payments. And because we That's double... Uh, two per year times 10. Thanks. Two times 10 is 20. Thanks. Mental math over here. I can't believe I put up with this sometimes. But so, can I. 20 <laughs> periods. And um, because we double the periods, we have to cut the interest rate in half. All right. So uh, 10 years at 3% interest is, is, is similar uh, for bond purposes at, at 20 years at 1.5%. So we are going to use that factor right there, the 0.74. I was actually saying, I can't read. I need bifocals on Two, my glasses. Four, <laughs> Thank you. We use that this factor. This is great that you can explain this method. Then. <laughs> That's right. So we have the $2 million multiplied by that 0.74247 factor. And that's going to give us the present value of that principal is uh, $1,484,000. So that's what $2 million is worth today. Mm -hmm. Now, we also have to do the present value of those interest payments. And in order to do that, we're going to go to the present value of the annuity table. So this is kind of building on our lesson eight that we just did. We use mm -hmm. these two tables. And we're once again going to use, it's 10 years, 3%, but we're going to use 20 periods, 1.5% because the interest is being paid twice per year. So we have that factor right there. It's 17 point something. I can't even read it. but 17.16864. Uh, <laughs> that's right. So we have $30,000. That's the amount of each interest payment. That's the $2 million of principal on the bond multiplied by a 3% annual interest rate multiplied by 6 twelfths. Six mm -hmm. uh, because it's paid twice per year. And we You know what's cool, Buzz? Six per, or three percent times six over twelve. That's one and a half percent, which is, is what you used on that table. Yeah, that's great. That's not um, a coincidence. <laughs> it isn't. And we multiply it by that factor, the seventeen point one, and that comes up with the present value of the interest payments, five hundred and fifteen thousand. And because this is issued at par, if we add those two together, we get two million dollars. You know, roughly rounded. Um, so that's just kind of what's going on behind the scenes. You would probably never do that in the real world. So for the remaining examples, we're going to use Microsoft Excel with young, hip Ben. <laughs> Take <laughs> it over, man. 
That's and right. I'm getting old, so maybe not so young anymore. But anyway, He's 30 now. Uh, I am 30 right now. Let's just switch over to Excel here for a second, and we can look at same situation that you have right here, raising two million bucks through new bond issuance. Um, we can put in our inputs into Excel. So the rate per period, that's just like we had before, one and a half percent. The three percent divided by two payments per year gives us one and a half percent. The number of periods, well, it's a ten-year bond, um, two payments per year, so ten times two bonds. And, and just 20. a quick comment: if, if interest was only being paid once per year, back when we used those tables and this example, then we would just would use three percent in ten yep. periods. It's because and if interest was being paid four times a year, we would have to use forty periods and zero point seven five percent interest. All right, back to exactly. You. Yeah, that's exactly right. So it's not always going to be semi-annually. A lot of bonds are, which is why we use it. But yep, exactly. Yeah, otherwise mm -hmm. you just got to use your judgment. Yep. The payment each period, this is something that I've had students struggle with in the past. Um, oh, sorry, I'm jumping the gun. We're doing the principal payment, present value of the principal payment right now. That is zero. You're not gonna pay back the principal at all. These are going to be term bonds. They pay them all back at the end of the term. So payment each period is zero. And our future value, how much do they have to pay back at the end? Negative two million. It's negative because it's an outflow. This company is computing this. It's going to uh, pay out the $2 million. Mm -hmm. So, boss, now pay attention to this cool part. Mm -hmm. There's this magical thing about Excel. You could Bing it if you wanted to. <laughs> or you could Bing it to look for Google. And then in Google, you could search for Excel. Um, you do equals. And then PV for present value is going to be our argument here. And the rate, the very first argument here, the rate, 1.5%. Then you put a comma. The number of periods, 20 add a comma the future sorry the payment amount zero put a comma and the future value two million bucks look at that you hit enter and we get one million four hundred eighty four thousand nine hundred forty dollars and eighty four cents which within rounding differences is what we computed on the other slide yeah you're gonna have a little difference between the tables and Excel just because the tables have a limited number of decimals but it's usually gonna be immaterial that it's not gonna be a big deal um, if we follow the same pattern for the interest payments um, same idea, we have 1.5% interest rate, 20 periods still, the payment each period, this is where we can do the calculation that students sometimes mess up. It's going to be the $2 million that they owe, and I'm going to make it negative again because they're paying it out, so cash is going out. So 2 million times, and we are going to use the stated rate of interest. In this case, it doesn't matter because they're the same, the stated and market rate, but in the future ones, remember, you use the stated rate of interest which is 3% times 6 over 12, gives us our 30,000. Future value, and this one's gonna be zero, there's no big lump sum payment or anything like that with the interest. So our present value equals present value, the rate, 1.5%, number of periods is 20, um, 30,000 is the payment amount, and the future value is zero. If you close it, look at that, 515,000. That's pretty much the same thing. Yeah, and probably the thing to point out that rate per period is technically the market rate right there. Mm -hmm. It just so happens, and this is the first example, that the market equals the stated rate. We're going to see how that changes in future examples. All right. So if we look at it, total amount of the liability then, well, the company is going to owe some principal. The company is going to owe interest throughout. So $2 million bucks is the total present value, just like we calculated with the other method. So we tease about it, but in reality, you're going to get the same answers either way. Mm -hmm. It's just how do you want to get there? Mm -hmm. All right, so if we look back on our slides here, the journal entry that we're going to make is going to be uh, debit to cash, credit to bonds payable. Boom. That's it. Mm -hmm. Notice bonds payable amount, $2 million bucks. What if... We need to pay interest. What are we going to do then, Buzz? Well, every six months, they are going to make an interest payment. And the amount of that interest payment, we've already computed that one. That's the, the $2 million times the 3% times 6 over 12. So we know it's a $30,000 interest payment. And uh, we're not accruing interest here or anything. So we can just go ahead and debit interest expense for the 30000 and then credit cash for the 30000 we will do that 19 times, and then on the... <laughs> Why you laugh? We, it just seems like a lot. A lot. Like, well, hey, the next slides, I'm going to click through that same entry <laughs> 19 right. times. We're, not, we're being efficient. So I yes. say we would do this 19 times, and then on the 20th time, we're not only going to pay interest, but we're going to pay back 
uh, the bond amount as well. So we still have the same interest expense, but now we're getting rid of that $2 million bond by debiting it, and we're going to credit cash for the total amount. And this is the simple, straightforward example uh, when bonds are issued at par. Yeah. Usually doesn't happen. Usually yeah. they are going to be issued instead at either a premium or a discount. Oh, we're going to try that again? <laughs> at a premium or, or a, a discount. discount. Yes. All we're right. getting less than nine. We're finally picking it up. Right. Um, all right. So when the bond is issued at a discount, the stated rate of interest is going to be less than the market rate of interest. So this would be where Disney says, you know what? I think we can pay 3% interest. And the market says, yeah, Disney, you're a little bit more sketchy than that. I think you should pay 4% just to compensate investors for the risk they're taking on. Um, when this happens, the company is going to receive less than the full amount it's asking for. So Disney won't receive a full two million bucks because they're not paying as much interest as the market wants. And interest expense that you record on the income statement is going to be greater than the cash interest paid each period because they're making up for that difference of them not receiving the full two million dollars. Anything to add here, Buzz? No, just on this example, you know, it's the same exact facts, except that this, the the market rate of interest is 4%. Mm -hmm. So the, the theory is here, if Disney has said, hey, we're, we're only going to pay 3%, the market says, fine, but we're then not going to give you as much money up front. All right. You can, you can Disney, you could have choose, chosen to pay 0%. We don't care. We're just going to give you what that's worth, given that there's a higher market rate of interest. So in this example, the big takeaway, you're going to see Disney's not going to get the full $2 million up front. Yeah. They're going to issue it at a discount. Which could be a problem if they wanted to raise $2 million bucks for, exactly. Yeah, exactly. For whatever so, it is. Yeah. And, and we're not going to go through the tables on the remaining examples right here. We're just going to skip right to Excel. Great. So we're in Excel here. The rate per period. In this case, remember, we are using the, the market, market rate, rate of interest. <laughs> so we have 4% and we are going to divide it by 2 because it's still semi-annually. So we're going to have 2%. Um, the number a very common or wrong answer would be put down 1.5% there. People would forget yep. that. Happens all the time. Number of periods, still 20 periods. That hasn't changed at all. The payment each period amount. Well, we said Disney is still going to pay 3%, right? That is their stated rate. That's yep. what they said. We're paying 3%. So it's still going to be the 30,000 we calculated before. So certainly a common wrong answer would have been to put 40 per, uh, yeah. 40,000 40, right there. 40,000. And sorry, I'm doing the right principal here, piece yeah. first. You can actually combine these two. We only have to calculate it once, but I like wanted this. to show the I show like the, the way mechanical you've done steps. It here, ben. So. Thank you, boss. On recording and everything. <laughs> that's right. So I'm going to go ahead that payment each period. That's negative 30,000. Put it down here. Um, mm -hmm. So we're ahead of the game. Woohoo! It's all right. Um, future value Disney still has to pay two million bucks at the end of this thing. Mm -hmm. And so now our present value formula equals PV, and you can use tab to select it. I'm dipping into our Excel video series here. Nice. Um, 2%, number of periods is 20, the payment is zero, and the type is, uh, sorry, the future value is two million. There we go. So that's right. actually less than the amount we computed in the other slide. Mm -hmm. So the other slide we had one million four eighty four, and this mm -hmm. one we're at one million three forty five. Mm -hmm. um, for the present value of the interest payments, the rate per period again that two percent using the market rate for that. The number of periods still twenty. The payment each period we calculated using the stated rate. The future value is going to be zero. And watch this, Boz. I'm gonna copy Control the C. present value. Control V. Whoa, Ooh, we're enter. enter. Wow. Yeah, look at that. And mm. this automatically did it for me, so I don't have to worry about it. We have 490000 for the present value of those interest Which payments. again is lower than it was on the previous slide. Exactly. So to summarize, the present value of our principal, that came out to 1345000 The present value of our interest came out to 490000 if we add these two together, we get one million eight hundred and thirty-six. Again, Disney's not offering a competitive rate, so it's the bondholders are like, that's fine. We're just not going to give you the full two million you want. The big thing here, though, is that Disney is going to actually have to pay two million dollars at the end. So it's yep. only getting one point eight million up front. It still has to pay the two million dollars at the end. So it's almost like there's going to be some sort of loss in there to, yeah. to to some extent. And it it's if you think about it, we're going to have. A payable for two million bucks, right? They owe that amount. The total present value, that's the cash they're getting today, is one million eight hundred thirty-six. So we have a gap between those two. Debit's got to equal credits. And so what we're gonna do is record something in an account called discount on bonds payable. 
So discount on bonds payable. This is a contra liability, liability. account. So a debit balance. Exactly. Yeah. And so when we look at our actual journal entry then, if we go back here, we see we have a debit to cash, a debit to the discount on bonds payable for the 163514 and a credit of bonds payable. All right, so that's the computation of recording the bond and the journal entry. Now we got to look at making the first interest payment and what that journal entry is. A little bit more complex here. Yeah, so to record our interest expense, we're going to use what's called the effective interest method. And this is what most companies use, but it's more complex because you can't have the same interest expense every single period. And we're going to be getting rid of part of this discount. We said it was a counter liability. We're going to be getting rid of part of it as we go through. We need to get rid of that discount by the time this bond is done by the end of the 10 years. And we don't do it all at once. We do it each period. So we could do straight line, but that is not as used in the real world. Exactly. So what we need to do, we have the carrying amount of the bonds. That's the present value that we calculated before. They're going to be shown on the books at the bonds payable amount minus that contra of the discount. That's the carrying amount. And so what we do is calculate interest expense as the carrying amount times 4%, which is the market rate of interest, times 6 over 12 because each period is only 6 months. So we have an interest expense of 36729 in period 1, 6 months later. Um, we're only paying cash of 30000 We've already calculated that. So the difference between the interest expense and the cash payment, that is how much we are reducing that discount. But Boz, now if that discount has been reduced, what's going to happen to the carrying amount of the, boz, of the bond is that that is going to go increase. Up. Yep. So now our carrying amount is a one million eight thirty six plus the amount of the discount that we got rid of. We're taking, we don't have as much of a discount anymore. So it's going to be closer to that two million bucks. And remember to use in that interest expense right there. This is a key computation. Use the market rate of interest um, and not the stated rate of interest. Exactly. But now that I've set it all up, I can just double click, drag it down, and you see by the end, we're at the $2 million carrying value. And this last entry will have gotten rid of the last little bit of our discount for us, and we'll be ready to pay everything back. Yeah, so I think the thing to point out then is if you looked at that second year, we once again compute interest expense um, using the market rate of interest, the uh, 4% times 612, so basically 2% of the carrying amount but as the carrying amount has, has gotten larger, uh, the interest expense has, already got, has also gotten larger. The discount amortization has also gotten larger. But that cash payment is staying the same year after year. Exactly right. And so if we were to go back to the slides for a second here, um, you can see the journal entry, debit interest expense, credit the discount on bonds payable, credit cash. That's just the first three columns that we had in our spreadsheet for us. It gives you the entry and as a company you can set up that spreadsheet right away and then it's just a matter of tying it into your system. Yep. And conversely, like the last slides we went through this, we said the same entry be made you know, 19 times. That's not going to be the case here because although the cash payment stays the same, the interest expense, just as we mentioned to that increases every period and the discount on the bonds payable also increases every period. Exactly right. Cool. I think that's good for discount, don't you? I think so. Well, we've done par. We've done a discount. There's one final thing left, and that must be premium. premium. We didn't practice that. <laughs> no, but we practiced <laughs> enough in this video that's that true. we should be pretty good at it. That's so uh, when a bond is issued at a premium, our stated rate is going to be greater than the market rate. So Disney says, I'm going to pay 3%, but the market says, you really only need 2%. And so they're going to make extra money. They're going to receive more than the full amount that they're asking for. Yeah, what that is, is if you're an investor and the market is, you know, similar companies would pay you 2% and Disney says, we'll pay you 3 you along with everyone else are going to want the Disney bonds. All mm -hmm. right. And then that's actually going to drive up the price of those Disney bonds. Wow, is that like econ again? Again, it's like econ, yeah, totally. Oh, look so, at that, that's perfect. Accounting and econ overlap quite a bit. They so. do, they do. And so interest expense recorded on your statement is going to be less than the cash interest paid each period. So if we were to use our same scenario that we've been using in the premium example here, you can see the market rate of interest is 2%. The stated rate is 3%. So our rate per period, Boz, we're using market rate or stated rate? I'm going to use market rate here. So again, half of that 2%. So it's going to end up to be 1%. Boom, 1%. Number of periods, 10 years, twice per year is still no 20. No change. The payment amount each period? Still zero. Still zero. And the future value? Still negative 2 million here. 
Look at that. Yeah, but Boom. this present value has gone up, be, and that makes sense because people are willing to pay more for these bonds because they're mm-hmm. paying a, a larger return than the market is. They're more excited about them. They are excited. <laughs> if we look at the interest payments, again, it is a 1% rate per period, 2% divided by 2. Um, the number of periods is 20. The payment amount each period. Still negative 30000 here, $30,000. Mm-hmm. And then a future value is still going to be zero. And so if we look at that, we have a present value of 541, 365, 366. So if you add those two together, total present value, 2,180,000. Um, we still owe that 2 million bucks at maturity. People are just willing to pay us more right now um, because we're giving that higher interest rate. And the premium on our bonds payable is going to be one eighty four fifty five. Yeah, you know, the theory is going to be because we got a hundred and eighty thousand dollar premium. That's almost like some sort of gain that we're going to be experiencing here. So uh, we're going to record that gain basically by reducing interest expense over the life of this bond. So you know, a, a, a gain uh, has the same effect on the interest on the on the income statement as a reduction to interest expense. Yeah, exactly right. Um, and that premium is very similar to what we have for a discount, except for it's just going to be, instead of a contra liability, it'll just be added on to that bonds payable one. So uh, our journal entry here, just so we're on the same same page, debit cash. For the amount you just computed. For the yep. amount you received, mm-hmm. credit, uh, premium on bonds payable. If it was a discount, it was debited. Now it's a premium, so it's credited. PC, credit the premium. <laughs> That's, CP. that's awesome. And then bonds payable. Look at that. It's two million Still bucks two million. again. What do you know? Yep. Um, so if we move on with this one, we also have to figure out the interest each period. Because we got the initial entry. Now we maintain it until the end. And again, we're going to be using our effective interest method. So that premium is increasing the carrying amount of the bonds payable. Our interest expense is going to be the carrying amount times the market the rate. The market interest. rate, not stated rate. The market rate. I thought you were trying to match up again. No, no, I was just trying to add emphasis. So it's <laughs> the two percent right. times six twelves, or one percent. One percent. Um, Twenty-one thousand. You can see quite a bit less than our cash payment there. Well, the difference, because we need our journal entry to balance, is going to go towards premium amortization, eight thousand one ninety-five. And now that carrying amount, it still needs to get down to two million bucks at the end. It's starting pretty high, but we need to get down there. So the two million one eighty subtracted by subtracted the by the premium amortization, two million one seventy two. Do you think I did it right, Buzz? I hope so. There's only one way to check. Highlight all those. Double click in the lower right hand corner. Go to the bottom and hope it says two million. Boom. Nice work. Two million. Ben. That's my journal entries for the rest of the time. Yeah. We're done. And again, look at that year two right there. Basically, you can see what's happening. That interest expense is still the one percent, but it's based on a lower carrying amount. So the premium amortization amount is actually going down over. T- uh, excuse me. The the interest expense is going down over time. The premium amortization therefore goes up. There we go. So if we want to see what the actual journal entries look like here, um, the first one, debit interest expense for 21804, debit the premium. Remember had a credit balance, so we're slowly reducing that. And then credit cash for 30 grand. And then for the next one, six months later, notice the interest expense amount is not the same, just like Boz was talking about, went down a little bit. The premium also changed, the premium went up a little bit. But the cash, cash payment's the same. Oh, it's thirty thousand dollars. All right, so it's been a lot of different numbers in here. Let's just look at a summary. And what I want to point out here is that regardless of if we have issues, issuance at par, or discount, or premium, some things are going to be the same, and other things are going to be a little different. So as you can see, par value, still $2 million bucks. We're going to have to pay back $2 million at the end. That's always going to be the same. Cash payment, always going to be the same. Every time, thirty grand. as long as we have that stated rate at 3%, we're always going to have to pay $30,000. I'm kind of looking at that line above, though, Ben, the cash received at issuance, and I you just look at the one where it's a premium, that $2.1 million. Wouldn't all companies want to issue bonds at a premium then, get the most cash up front? You know, I was supposed to grill you with these questions, Foss, but no maybe, way. maybe no we way. mix it up. Yeah, so um, certainly it looks good, right? You get an extra $180,000, that's great. But what that means is that as a company, you issued the bond at a premium, meaning you're paying more interest than you actually needed to. So yeah, you might get more money, but 
this thirty thousand dollar cash payment should probably be lower for you. So instead I of have, offering three percent, you should have offered two percent. Two percent only had to pay twenty grand each period. So mm-hmm. it all it should all work itself out in the end. So mm-hmm. if you get more cash up front, you got to pay more cash over the life of the yeah. bond. The discount example, you get less cash up front, but now you're only paying thirty thousand dollars per period. But there was a four percent market rate there. Um, you, you you don't have to pay forty grand of interest each yeah. period. You only pay thirty grand. So usually what companies do is try and shoot for par. They're going to yep. try and get it is, is a little bit of a longer lead time by the time they line up all their investors. Mm-hmm. So they might have a slight difference, but they're going to try and shoot for par. And then over time, the interest rate that they're offering is going to change. Yeah, I mean, the market rates, they change just mm-hmm. every minute, every hour or whatever. So they, uh, they have to state a rate at some point in time, and that's why they can't nail it. Yeah. All right. So let's look at some of our key takeaways. Number one, many companies do use bonds. These are very popular, not just, uh, oh, we'll learn about it in an academic setting and move on. They, um, it's a really big bond market. Um, number two, we can issue bonds at a par, at a discount, or for a premium. And then number three, we have to record those bonds at the present value of future payments, including both the interest and the principal. And then if we have a discount or a premium, we can amortize that. I think it I think it's a wrap. So bonds, you know, it's a narrow concept, but it's such a big number on companies' financial statements that uh, we really have to dig in and understand the accounting behind it. Yeah. All right, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time.